In this episode, we're going to look at a fraud that involves something that many of us use just about every single day, our automobiles. Now, when you buy a used car, you don't expect that it will threaten the lives of you and your family, but unscrupulous auto shops will sell you a car that either has defective airbags or simply none at all. Now, victims of this fraud have been seriously injured in crashes, and as you'll learn tonight, some have even lost their lives. Now, you think it can't happen to you? Well, according to one estimate, as many as one in 25 used vehicles may not have properly functioning airbags, and one of them could be yours. But first, we're going to show you another type of vehicle fraud that can leave you financially ruined. There are dealers who will take your extremely expensive RV onto their lot and promise to sell it on consignment. Now, these unscrupulous dealers end up pocketing the money and leave you holding the bag. But as ever, there are ways to protect you and your family, and tonight, we're going to show you how. In all the time I've been in business, and, and I've dealt with people on the other side of the world, the one guy that's beaten me lives 70 miles away from me. I believe that there's probably over 100 victims that actually were affected by him. There's a lot of money that he made, and I think greed is, is probably the biggest uh, motivator here. The amount of money that we're aware of that Mr. Earl defrauded people of was over $2 million. 85 charges of fraud, over 5,000, and nine counts of fraud under. What I just, you know, felt violated. There is nothing like leaving everyday stresses behind and hitting the open road. The carefree life of RV traveling is being embraced by those seeking freedom and adventure. For many, those happy times became a nightmare they'd soon rather forget when Donald Earl, a cunning RV salesman, entered the picture. Mr. Earl had a couple of different uh, um, schemes, uh, if you will. Um, one of them was he would agree to sell your RV on consignment and he would sign a consignment agreement with you. And in most cases there was a written consignment agreement. So he would go to a local Ministry of Transportation office and um, pretend that he needed to uh, get a new permit for a vehicle and then under false pretenses would ask for one, pay the $10 or whatever the fee was to get one and then convert the vehicle for his own purposes and not have any intention of paying the consumer the monies that they were owed for their vehicle. I own a business. I had originally purchased a, a recreational vehicle to use as a, uh, as a mobile showroom. We like to travel when we retired. One of our goals to get around and see, especially because we are immigrants and there are so many places in this uh, big continent we haven't visited. Point came where uh, I wanted to sell it because of the type of vehicle it is. It's not you just go down to the local dealership and, and move it out. I had a trailer that was about nine years old, in good shape, except it had started to take in water in, through the roof. I found Mr. Earl's uh, address through the uh, yellow pages in the phone book and phoned them up and told them that I need some repair done on my trailer. And whether they would do that, oh yes, sure, come on over. And I took the uh, trailer over and uh, had them look at that. And the first thing they said, do you want to sell it? If the price is right, I may consider it. I sell it at 10,000 or better, then I would go ahead and sell it. Uh, sure, that should be easy. We all started getting in motion. You know, agreements were signed. They took possession of the vehicle, physically. When they took possession of the, uh, the vehicle to drive it up to the lot, you know, he said, well, where's your ownership? Well, no, I'm keeping the ownership. Put it up on their lot, and as people went by, it was being shown to prospective customers. On the traffic in there, potential buyers, and the amount of uh, merchandise, it looked as if it was 100% solid. So I never thought this could be a dubious uh, business. Uh, we drafted a contract and uh, in the amount of ten thousand dollars so just leave it with us and we'll take good care of it i did inquire um, you know he's phoning a couple weeks i'd phone in a couple weeks and and you know there seemed to be some people looking at it and uh 
So anyways, there was an opportunity I had uh, to travel past that location on other business. But on the way back, I would drop in and take a look and see if it was there. Well, when I got there, uh, the vehicle wasn't on the lot. You could smell that there was trouble. When I got there, uh, the vehicle wasn't on the lot. You could smell that there was trouble. With that knowledge that it wasn't there, I uh, went to um, one of the kiosks that the Department of Motor Vehicles has, and for $20, got a report that said that I didn't own it anymore. Complaints started to come in about Mr. Earl and the Barry RV sales. Uh, at the time, it was just a few complaints. Nothing happened for a month or so until I started thinking, shouldn't they have sold it now since they said it would be an, an easy sell? And therefore, I phoned the company, and they said, no, no, it hasn't been sold yet. I started hearing some rumors about something not being right out there. It appeared uh, that there was a wide-scale problem with this uh, consignment sales place. Imagine your surprise when the vehicle you left at a dealer to sell is nowhere in sight. Customers visiting the lot can't find their trailers, and Mr. Earl is also hard to find. Willie convinced the receptionist to give him Donald Earl's cell phone number, but all he got was more lies. Uh, he then said, oh yeah, the trailer had just been sold yesterday. I asked him whether then the secretary could go ahead and write us a check, which he said he, he couldn't, because according to the contract, they had 30 days to pay us back. The, the facts I had in front of me indicated that there was a fraud. And uh, as far as the government was concerned, as far as the Department of Motor Vehicles was concerned, I did not own that vehicle. Okay, now why don't I own the vehicle? Well, you signed the ownership. Well, I didn't sign the ownership. Well, there were also circumstances where Mr. Earl's uh, modus operandi was a little different. And what he would do is he would sell someone a vehicle, um, but that vehicle's lien, the existing lien from the original purchaser, had never been satisfied. So you buy the good in good faith, thinking that you have ownership of it and free and clear entitlement to it. Um, and it turned out in a lot of cases, he never paid off the original finance company. So consumers were confronted in some cases with a knock on their door or a phone call from a finance company saying, I'm sorry, but this vehicle is leaned and you owe us. And in some cases, the amount of money that was owed was, you know, 70 or 80 or even more thousand dollars. When Mr. Earl came to our attention that he was possibly uh, defrauding a, a fair amount of people, uh, investigation team began uh, with search warrants for his uh, business, uh, production orders for bank accounts, several dozen uh, victim statements. The reality was, is that I was behind the eight ball. Well, you phone the insurance company and, and you tell them that, uh, you know, what's transpired and they go, oh, well, we'll send that off to the claims department and then they came back and goes, we cover you for, for theft but unfortunately this is fraud and we don't cover you for fraud and, and thank you very much. Mr. Earl was very convincing. He was very quick on his feet with responses to questions um, from consumers. 30 days came and went and Willie had heard nothing from Donald Earl or the RV dealer. Willie took the matter into court and he sued. I came into the court and the judge awarded me the full amount that uh, Mr. Earl owed me. It was of course the question how to get the money and there uh, the court told me point blank that uh, that wouldn't be easy. That was up to myself to get the money out of him. Mr. Earl had started a business in uh, a smaller town. My son and I then went there to confront him and serve him the papers. My son then looked around and that's when he approached him and said to him, uh, hello, Mr. Earl, how are you? <laughs> and, and so, and who are you? And then my son and son just said, uh, here you are, these are the, per uh, the papers that serve, are served upon you to come to court. And Mr. Earl then took the envelope with the papers and he just ripped it and threw it on the ground with quite an attitude. No remorse for sure. And that was when I realized I might as well forget the whole sorry story. Being a retired person on a fixed income, $10,000 does hurt. We were able to arrest him in September of 2005. 
On the 19th day of September uh, 2005, it was a trial date for Mr. Earl, and we had very credible, very honest victims that uh, I think at the end of the day when Mr. Earl saw everything piled against him, he pled guilty to 85 charges of fraud, over 5,000, and nine counts of fraud under 5,000. Mr. Earl received three years in a federal penitentiary and a restitution order of $2.6 million to the victims. I think Mr. Earl was driven by greed. I think Mr. Earl did not have a conscience. Somebody does something to you, and you, you know, you can either sit back and say, you know, lesson learned or fight back. Make sure you run a used vehicle information package so that you can verify whether or not there are liens outstanding on the vehicle you intend to, uh, to purchase. And make sure that if you did leave it there and the dealer is going to satisfy an existing lien, um, that they ha can provide you with proof that they actually have satisfied the lien. And certainly not leaving signed ownerships or powers of attorney that give, um, give anybody the right to transfer vehicles out of your name um, is very ill-advised. Fraud is rivaling the drug trade right now, and, and uh, the losses each year to victims all over the world is staggering. One out of every five salvaged vehicles this has happened to. Saturday night, on a, coming home on a two-lane country road, and unfortunately his friend fell asleep at the wheel, and Bobby took the impact of the other car that hit them. Bobby died immediately. When the police did their investigation, they told me that the airbags had been stuffed with paper. I think the profit and the greed overcomes any other human compassion that they may or may not have. People have been uh, killed or maimed uh, as a result of this type of fraud. It shocked me to find out that this is absolutely a common practice, that people do this every day, that they don't even think twice about it. Our son Bobby was a very active 18-year-old. Grew up in um, a rural community outside of San Diego. He had a lot of enthusiasm for, for everything he did, and he loved to fish. And he had a very good friend who he'd known for almost all out through school. His parents bought a, a truck for him. Arnold Parra owned a body shop and he would just fix vehicles, but as a side business, he decided that he would go to these auction places and buy salvaged vehicles and fix them up and sell them. My husband and I went out that evening, that Saturday evening, and we thought Bobby was gonna be staying home. And we told him, um, okay, be good, you know, and don't have too many friends over. And uh, when we got home, he, his car was there, but he was gone. He was out with his friend Whalen at some friend's house in another rural community. We gotta make sure we bring some of their spices up, because now I know how to barbecue. Coming home on a two-lane country road, And unfortunately, his friend fell asleep at the wheel. Bobby took the impact of the other car that hit them. I understood that Bobby died immediately. When the police did their investigation and I talked to his friend's parents, they told me that the airbags had been stuffed with paper. When Mary came to me and told me about what happened to Bobby and that uh, there, were air there was basically garbage stuffed into the airbag compartment, my heart just sank. I, I just felt that this was absolutely wrong. Arnold Parra, the one who owned the body shop, told Bob Blocker that, you know, he got a vehicle in mint condition, that there it had not even been in a front-end accident, that it was in, only in a very small rear-end accident. Arnold Parra saw this vehicle. He absolutely knew the airbags had been, been deployed. He consciously lied to a very close friend of his about what had happened to that vehicle. 
Since Bobby's accident, we've learned that this is very common in salvage vehicles. What the criminal element would do would be take this bag, take the cover off and glue it, and then stuff it full of whatever they had at hand. Close back up, and if you didn't really look at it closely, you may not notice that it's a deployed airbag. A shop like this can turn out hundreds of vehicles a year where they don't replace the airbags. And that's just, if it's, you just look at one vehicle, they may be saving $3,000. They could be making you know, $300,000 uh, by telling people that there are airbags in it when there's not. The Vehicle History Report can help alert you to the potential of a prior airbag deployment um, through accidents and service records that have been reported to us. The beauty of the Carfax system is that we gather information from 34,000 sources so you don't have to. In this particular instance, this vehicle started its life in California and very quickly was involved in a major accident. Uh, the airbag deployed and it was declared a salvage title by, or issued a salvage title by the state of California. Prior to the creation of the Carfax system, the used car purchaser in Wisconsin would have had no access to that information, wouldn't have known that that vehicle had been previously titled in California and issued a salvage title. This particular salvage title was reissued and uh, it's current, this car is currently uh, being uh, operated in Indiana. The problem with this situation is that you do not even think about it uh, whether your airbags are working or not, unless you're in an accident and unless you absolutely need them. And um, at that point, it's usually too late. Take you through some of the points that you need to look at and some of the easy things to spot when a fraudster has been doing his normal work and trying to deceive you, the unsuspecting car buyer. Uh, in the dashboard area where the passenger bag is, you look for any abnormalities, any creases, any tears, any obvious repairs, seams that uh, don't look like factory. And the same goes for the driver airbag. Uh, make sure that there's no tears. Uh, make sure that the horn works. Look for any creases in the headliner. Handles, uh, grab handles that are broken. Uh, any damage to the sun visors. If it's uh, had a deployment, there's a lot of plastic in these, in these cars and a lot of the plastic gets damaged. Uh, side airbags are usually mounted in the seats. That's the favorite place for a lot of the manufacturers. Uh, there is a seam here. Uh, I've seen people where they've sewn up uh, the airbag uh, deployment seam, and you can see that because it doesn't look like factory stitching. Arnold Parra never took responsibility for this accident and, and what had happened to Bobby. The jury, they awarded an amount for the loss of Bobby, but they awarded $15 million in punitive damages against Arnold Parra we got the verdict against him. Uh, we learned that he committed suicide in his shop. Only, I believe it was 18 days after the verdict. We just go on and just hope that there, there will be a change and that uh, someone doesn't have to die unnecessarily because of greed.